Well, welcome back. We are in 2 Corinthians. Uh, we've moved into chapter 2 today. Um, we've seen um, some of the background here, and Paul is addressing this troublesome church. Uh, the Corinthian church is, uh, needs some strong medicine, and Paul is giving it to them. And we see um, in this chapter, uh, he's continuing to talk about his change in plans. He's forced to defend himself and explain uh, he's not fickle, but he's obedient. And the Lord is at work in his delay for the good of the Corinthians. Uh, he addresses that in verses 1 through 4. And then he addresses uh, forgiveness. Uh, forgiveness in verses 5 through 11. It's probably the most uh, profound verses about forgiveness uh, in the New Testament. So it's good to study these closely. And then he moves into discussing his ministry in verses 12 through 17. And if you recall from yesterday, uh, the overall outline of this uh, book is that it's uh, explanation of his ministry in verses 1 through 7. So that's our chapters 1 through 7. And that's exactly what we're seeing here today. So with regard to the change, uh, he, start, he continues uh, from uh, yesterday uh, saying he was not looking forward to a, another hurtful confrontation with some who are in Corinth. So Paul is, uh, was not, uh, he's admitting he wasn't looking forward to um, a painful meeting with the members of the church who are uh, resisting him, rebelling against his apostolic authority. It's not to say he was not willing to go, but he's admitting that he wasn't looking forward to that meeting. And uh, his motive is to, um, in the delay, uh, and in the delay that the Lord gave him, was to give them time to change their mind, give them time to repent. Uh, so this delay has given them an opportunity for some to change their mind and um, some, it seems, were also disciplined by the church. So when we come to verses 5 to 11, he starts speaking to the uh, discipline that's gone on. Begins in the ESV. I'm looking at the ESV here in verse 5. Now, if anyone has caused pain. So it's posed as a question, but um, in the Greek text, the um, answer is assumed to be someone has caused pain. You could easily translate this instead of if someone has caused pain, uh, translated since someone has caused pain. So Paul is addressing that. And as you read through this, you'll see that the church has disciplined this offender. And Paul's saying that's enough, right? Uh, they've disciplined, they've gone through the uh, process of discipline from Matthew chapter 17, uh, I would imagine. And uh, they've gone through that. This man has uh, repented. So Paul says, enough's enough. Now's the time uh, to restore the forgiven offender and welcome them back into fellowship. And uh, uh, again, it's uh, important that the idea behind um, discipline is to uh, repair and restore. Now, um, discipline of... Um, Various people in the congregation uh, require different levels of restoration. And specifically what I'm talking about is uh, elders who sin. And when we get to First and Second Timothy and Titus, elders who are disciplined have uh, forfeited their uh, leadership opportunity. And uh, they can be restored to fellowship, certainly, uh, but not to leadership. And... Uh, Paul here is encouraging the church to take this brother or sister who had been disciplined and restore them to full fellowship in the church. So this is another principle. Uh, sometimes I write these out into the in margin of my Bible, try to principalize the text so that I can uh, apply it. And the principle here is that discipline is restorative, not punitive. It's intended to restore, it's intended to help a brother, uh, it's intended to uh, help them uh, resist sin in the future. Uh, it's not punitive. Uh, they're not going to prison. They're not kicked out of the fellowship permanently, uh, but they're brought back in. 
So discipline is restorative, not punitive. Verses 12 through 17, then Paul begins to uh, uh, talk about his ministry. And very interesting verses here. Paul's making the point that he was uh, uh, had this opportunity to preach. Um, he went to uh, Troas. It's interesting if you look at verse 12. When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was open for me in the Lord, my spirit... Uh, was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them, and went on to Macedonia. So here Paul is uh, going from Ephesus um, around, uh, taking a land route to Corinth. And uh, he's looking for Titus coming the other way, not finding him. Comes to Troas, he's invited to preach. Apparently he preaches a door of opportunity But he doesn't stay, even though that door is open. He didn't stay to plant a church there, but he moves on because he's so upset, uh, so distraught about uh, the news that Titus might be bringing. So he moves on. Isn't that interesting? Uh, Wouldn't it be, uh, I uh, envy him, I think, uh, some ways of being able to uh, turn away, to, to be so clear on his mission that he turns away from an open door of ministry and moves on. I mean, how many of us would uh, just look at that and say, well, there's an open door here, I'm going in. And uh, But Paul didn't do that. He was concerned about Titus and he was concerned about the church. And we see in the subsequent verses that he turned from the pain of ministry to the privileges of, of his position in Christ as a servant and what that uh, did is he it, uh, restored his joy. You know, Paul uh, apparently um, stopped dwelling on the, min- on the uh, problems that were happening in Corinth and started to reflect on the privileges he had in the position that Christ had put him in. And it restored him to his joy, and uh, he, uh, he, he burst into thanks here. He uh, thanks for uh, being led by the Lord. He uh, is thankful for the ultimate victory that he knows is his through Christ. We know how the story ends. Uh, if you will see that in the book of Revelation. Uh, but Paul's confident that uh, Christ will be victorious in the end. And he's, he's um, thankful that he's used as an um, influence for Christ wherever he goes. Uh, you know, for the uh, believers, he's a sweet fragrance for the people who reject him. Uh, he smells like death, and uh, uh, so no matter where he goes, uh, he's having an impact. And then he defends himself again. Uh, you know, Paul is, I told you, the uh, um, chapter or the title for the whole book is Paul's Defense. So we see that Paul is defending himself and distinguishing himself from others in terms of his sincerity. He, in other words, he has a pure motive here. He doesn't have mixed motives. He's not trying to get money from them. He's not trying to uh, uh, get prestige through them. He's not asking for anything from them. Uh, You know, um, as I said yesterday, money's mentioned in all three of these letters that um, that we're encountering so far. Uh, But Paul's motive was not to uh, reap uh, profit from what he was doing. In fact, he... Uh, forego- he foregone uh, the right he had to support from the gospel. Uh, but he did not uh, say that then money was not uh, necessary in some way. So, but he makes the point that he's, uh, his ministry is sincere. Uh, it's not to uh, embellish uh, his reputation or his pocketbook. He also asserts against those who would question his ap- apostolic authority that his commission is divine and the message of his ministry is the message of Christ. So we've seen Paul now in these first uh, couple of chapters here um, talk about his equipping to comfort them and uh, his change in plans, defending himself against the charge of being fickle, encouraging the church to receive that brother who was disciplined And now he's moved into talking about the sincerity of his ministry. Pray that uh, um, you 
Uh, never run into a situation in ministry where you have to be defending your motive, defending your message. Um, let your life uh, demonstrate um, what your motive is and let your mouth uh, share the pure gospel so that no one can question the message that you have. We'll see as we go through this that Paul is going to do that very thing in his defense point to the fruit from his ministry, as well as the message of his ministry and its effect. God bless you, brothers and sisters, and uh, enjoy your reading today in 2 Corinthians.